actions of a beneficent tendency which proceed from proper motives seem alone to require reward. Adam Smith. Vernon Smith's experimental results are trying to trace through the idea that a stagnant utility function cannot really depict how man acts. And instead, a richer understanding of context and the environment that we're in and the experiences that we have formerly have, those kind of things shape how we act and how we kind of rationally pursue our endeavors. Vernon Smith was showing that Adam Smith's richer understanding of human behavior cannot be represented by a simple stagnant utility function that is like a Rawlsian utility function or an other interested altruistic utility function. Those are too simple, right? And so what he showed is this quote really highlights the evidence that he received from those trust games and the involuntary trust game, right? If you move first, right, if you're player A, then you're making player B better off by passing things along to them in those trust games. This motive is proper, it's kind, because you can see what I could have done. I, as player A, right, or the first mover as player A, could have just taken the sure thing payoff, right? Which is actually rational for me to do. It's the Nash play within that. The point, a, the point is, is that player A passes along to player B and that pass actually conveys meaning. There is a message that is associated with that element of the game. The meaning is that player A had motives that were good that they were willing to trust, to cooperate, to do what they thought was fair. What was kind? The context and the circumstances are very important. Signals matter. Information is conveyed through exchange. Actions lead to inferences. And we have a general guiding rules to our behavior that come from these interactions. There's a moral fabric to society. There's a morality, there's moral sentiments about proper responses to inferred behaviors. And these moral sentiments have power over how we act. Interaction in Adam Smith's world is an exchange process. Smithian sentiments come about via an exchange process, right? So Adam Smith tells of examples of two individuals and in, you know, in a group of other individuals and one comes forward and tells kind of an inappropriate joke for that context. And the second individual, what will they do? They will frown upon the first individual. They'll say, uh, you know, that's kind of like a, you know, that doesn't work here, right? They'll kind of frown or feel uneasy about that. This has been an exchange. The first person has received kind of this negative feedback. Similar to an economic system, we can get profit or loss. We can get that in kind of a moral norm situation where we can get positive feedback that we're acting appropriately or negative feedback, kind of a loss feedback, like, whoa, this doesn't work here. Many times over, we as individuals have gotten feedback from settings like these, from our parents, from our friends, coworkers, right? Fellow classmates. If you get a pie and there's two people, what does your mom tell you to do? you split it close to even. And if you don't, she frowns or maybe scolds you. It's the ultimatum game, right? Our life isn't some one-shot game with just purely anonymous individuals that you will never see again. Again, Even when we have one-shot anonymous games, we still are playing with Adam Smith's you know, impartial spectator sitting on our shoulder. We have to kind of live with ourselves and our actions. And we have to see how we have actually behaved. Our actions are signals that enable people to read our intentions. They can inform the context of the situation. Intentions are central to the understanding of the meaning of our actions in Smith's world. How mad are you when someone means to help you, but actually hinders you? How mad are you when someone means to hinder you and truly does hinder you? Those answers are very different. When someone means to help, but they hinder, eh, that stinks. How mad are you when someone means to hinder and they actually do? 
You are furious. You cannot believe their intentions. Intentions are central to understanding the meaning of actions. This helps us understand how to relate to other people and what the context of the situation is. This kind of information does not and cannot show up within the social preferences utility functions of something like a max utility, egoistic utility function, or an altruistic utility function that is stagnant. In the involuntary trust game that we showed, the cooperation by player two decreases. Why? Because there is no beneficence for player two to reward. It is these norms and social rules that give certain contexts and behaviors meaning, right? Such as we should see that we should reward this beneficence. These ideas guide our action. In other words, this type of action is not best understood as this social preference function. Instead, it's an ecological rationality. Ecological rationality incorporates possible intelligence embodied in rules, norms, and institutions from our cultural and biological heritage. These norms are created from human interactions, but they are not created by deliberate human design. The rationality of our decisions depend on its context. We develop and adapt our behaviors to these contexts, but we just learn these norms by being human and interacting with other humans. That humans rapidly learn and effectively use heuristics, norms, and rules is consistent with the lessons learned from evolutionary psychology. These actions within contexts and settings allow us to achieve what is not achievable without the development of those norms. Think back to how we do better than the Nash play in game theory of prisoner's dilemma games or public goods games. Real people achieve better than hyper-rational homo economicus. When it actually pays for us to repeatedly play non-egoistic max u, hyper-rational maximizing play, right? When it pays for us not to do the optimizing max play in certain settings, it turns out that in those settings, we often as people don't play the max u egoistic play. The context matters greatly, but even that is showcasing the importance of an ecological rationality and not a hyper rationality of calculation. There's some substantial evidence that in market civilizations, individuals actually play ultimatum and trust games much more cooperatively. The critique that markets make us more selfish simply is not true according to these experiments. Having a rationality that creates norms of trust, cooperation, and fairness can reduce the transaction costs of society more and more, but cannot, this cannot be done as well in places where the ecological rationality simply doesn't support it. If the norms in a setting are such that there is no trust, you cannot just go in with an Airbnb and say, oh no, trust these people. The development of norms and traditions can be really important for the success of a citizenry. And so studying these concepts of norms, conventions, institutions, and how they impact our ecological rationality can be really important questions for economics and understanding an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. So it should be stressed and emphasized that it is not true that homo economicus is by definition selfish. Self-interest is not selfish. It is not necessarily untrusting, uncooperative, or not fair. Economists take preferences as given and see if their means achieve their ends. Subjectivism is really important. Thus, the neoclassical model could theoretically be saved by social preferences. Just bringing this element of payoff to fairness or trust or whatever it is and putting it as part of the utility function. However, the model only assumes individuals consistently optimize their self-interest. And so we don't have to do away with the neoclassical model as what we could potentially think here. It says nothing about their preferences, right? So the standard neoclassical model, it could have this non-selfish behavior. 
And behavioral economics appropriately calls our attention to these non-selfish stories, right? It helps make this kind of point clear that the, the approach to self-interest is not necessarily one of selfishness. Behavioral has done a service by calling attention to these elements, but it steps over its bounds when it says that homo economicus is selfish, followed by a proof that he is not selfish, then laughter in the face of neoclassicism. When we capture trust and make it part of our world, great things can happen. We often do not talk about trust, fairness, and the micro level cooperation in economics. I rarely do it in my classes, and I'm one who's very inclined to. Behavioral has thus done a nice job of bringing this to the forefront and saying that in some contexts, trust, cooperation, and fairness is really important. We should really want to unleash any element of human behavior that actually transforms and helps society in this really positive way. You can think about how designing for trust or creating institutions that can harness trust can unleash greatness within society. But we have to understand that there is an ecological rationality to our behavior and that we probably should not model it as a social preferences utility function, according to Vernon Smith. That's up for you to decide what, what kind of model helps us understand the world better. And in different contexts of study, different approaches will be more beneficial. It may be that you want to simply have a very kind of egoistic neoclassical model because all of this stuff doesn't matter. It may be that a social preferences utility function can help you see what you need to see for your analysis of the setting. But it may be that the ecological rationality of Vernon Smith and seeing kind of our norms and conventions and how trust and cooperation and, and fairness really can be brought together within how man actually acts. And we can think about what institutions promote these things. All three approaches have their merits in different contexts. But only the approaches that allow for trust, cooperation, and fairness allow us to see society beyond our belief. Right? We should embrace the idea that trust, cooperation, and fairness can take us beyond what seems reasonable and efficient within a simple model. It's society beyond our belief because of our beliefs. So what we've seen in behavioral economics is a contrast with the neoclassical, hyper-rational economic man. But in this section, we have been saying that error is obvious, that clearly we're not going to meet the standards of the neoclassical homo economicus version of the economic character. Error, though, is everywhere. Error is obvious. And in this case, what we've done is we've looked at the error, so to speak, of the neoclassical man versus what we actually do, the error of trust, cooperation, and fairness. And what we've shown in this lecture is that sometimes that error can actually be market enhancing instead of detracting.